Greetings YouTube, this is Gaisuiros, and on today's video we will talk about a broader topic, the topic of Celticity and more precisely how to define it. First of all, we need to make a difference between the Gauls and the Celts. The Gauls are a small group inside the big category of Celts. They are people from the precise region of Gaul. The word comes from Galli in Latin. We also have the word Galates in Greek and Latin, which pertains to a certain category of Gauls which attacked Greece and Asia Minor. This word was surely the same in the Gaulish languages, and it had a broader meaning, the strong ones. The strong ones may be applied only to the raiders, like Vikings to the Scandinavians, or maybe it meant all of the Gauls, or what we call today Gauls. The Celts are a bigger category, it contains all the people from outside of Gaul. This English word comes from Keltoi in ancient Greek. From the same Gaul root, it is possible that the K and the O stem come from a non Celtic dialect, or perhaps it is only due to the Greek influence on the word. The biggest divide inside this broader group of Celts is the one of the insular Celts versus the continental Celts. Today only what we consider as insular Celts remain. Let's start with two ways to identify Celticity. The first one with linguistics and then with the material culture. Defining Celticity with linguistics seems simple to us since today this is how the modern Celtic groups are defined. This is hard to argue against because the Celtic languages are indeed a solid group. Evidence though is hard to find because the Celts, before Christianization, left us barely no written traces. However, a language doesn't represent a racial or genetic category. Anybody from any ethnicity can learn the language and speak it. And finally, language isn't culture. Culture is much more than language. So linguistics is not enough to define Celticity. We can also look at the material culture, things that were left behind, either objects or people or animals, that define Celticity. We can easily identify Celtic art, Celtic metalworking, Celtic burial rites. The origins of such things can be debated, and the evidence is somewhat plentiful. But material goods can be traded to and from different cultures. We have found, for example, Roman wine in Celtic territory, and also Celtic metalworks in Germanic territory. So. A third option would be to look at genetics. It is precise data with retraceable origins. But the evidence that we have for Celtic genetics is more complicated than the projected cultural boundaries. We can find Celtic genetic markers in non-Celtic populations such as Italy, Germany, Scandinavia and the weirdest one, the Basque country since they don't even speak an Indo-European language. Celtic genetics can also vary within the populations. For example, a study has shown that the Welsh people of today have much more genetic variations than the English people of today. But according to historical linguistics, the Celts come from the Indo-European migrations. By comparing related languages, we have found the origins of the peoples who spoke them. Since the Celtic languages are a pretty solid group and are still spoken today, it is possible to paint a pretty solid picture of where they come from. Their origins lie in the Indo-Europeans, a constructed group of people who migrated across Europe and Asia. They developed usage of the wheel, the horses and bronze. This gave them the means to travel far and spread influence across Europe. Thus. What was once different tribes with different dialects in the early Indo-European world became different languages and groups of languages depending on the local populations that they found. The Celts were also one of the first peoples to use iron. This gave way to a second migration where they settled in what is today France, Spain and Portugal and also the British Isles. Celtic languages evolved unique sound mutations from the original Indo-European language. This includes the loss of word initial P and between vowels. For example, the word for father 
in Indo-European was Pter, and it became Atir in Gaulish. Another mutation is that the sound Q becomes either P or K. For example, the Indo-European word for hundred, Quatuores, became Pedwar in Welsh and Kehir in Irish. And we can also note the change of the Q sound to a B sound. The word for woman in Indo-European was Gwen and became Bena in Gaulish. We also have to talk about how Celtic languages have evolved since antiquity. A lot of people, including myself, are surprised to see at first that the Gaulish language doesn't really sound like the modern Celtic languages. This is partly due to these sound mutations. Modern Celtic languages, like many other Indo-European languages, lost the final thematic vowels such as O and A. What was once Kapana in Gaulish became Kaban in Welsh. This original Gaulish word gave us Kaban in French, which means cabin. We can look at another Gaulish word, Kavalos. This one became Kefel in Welsh and Kapel in Irish. This word entered Latin, and in French it gave us Cheval, which means horse, just like in Gaulish, in Welsh and Irish. Modern Celtic languages underwent a process of African and Lenishan. The word for sword, Cladivos, became Cladivos and then Cladif in Welsh. Also, excuse my pronunciation of Welsh and Irish, I've only started to study these languages. The next mutation is very unique for Indo-European languages. Because words lost their final thematic vowels, there had to be a change to indicate the different grammatical cases. So the beginning of words started to change instead. The word for woman in Irish, ben, becomes na in the dative case. And the word for clothes in Welsh, dilid, becomes nilid for the first person possessive plural. These might be mutations unique to the insular Celtic languages. Gaulish can even sound closer to Latin in some cases than to modern Celtic languages. In fact, the Romans themselves said that written Gaulish was fairly easy to translate. This is because the case endings, the phonology and the verbal particles are very similar. I chose a sentence here to show how similar they can be. The sentence means, I want the sword of the king or the king's sword. In Gaulish, that will be Gladion Rikis Velor, while in Latin it will be Gladium regis volo. The word for sword has the accusative case with the nasal consonant. The word for king shows the genitive case with the s and the additional e vowel. The word for I want in Gaulish has an additional r at the end, but that won't be too hard to translate. However, in Welsh, this sentence would be Du yes yao klesif eri. This sentence literally translates to I am in wanting, sword, the king. The sound mutations and the way the sentence is structured will be completely alien to Gauls. This brings up the problem of time. 2000 years separate Gaulish and the modern Celtic languages. 2000 years also separate the modern Celtic cultures to the Gaulish culture. I think it is a mistake to compare the modern Celtic cultures to the ancient ones, unless you know exactly what changed between both of them. In a lot of aspects, Gauls were the product of their time, just like the Romans were, and they shared a lot with them. Just think about how similar you are today to your geopolitical neighbors. Today, if you want to learn about the ancient Celts, you might come across some Wicca and Neo-Pagan interpretations. You must be careful, because they are modern romantic interpretations. Wicca uses some Celtic symbolism, such as Maponos, in the context of fulfilling a role in this modern religion. While Wicca doesn't claim to be a Celtic religion, neo-pagans, even though they try to reconstruct pagan religions, are more about having a complete set of beliefs, so they might cut corners short when they don't have enough evidence. But most importantly, they are not living in the proper context of antiquity. Defining Celticity is not a simple task. My name's Gesuiros, thanks for watching my video, see you next time.